Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune into the good news of the gospel. Greg Fritz has been changing lives through the good news of the gospel for over 35 years. This good news will inspire, inform, and change you so you can live daily in all the promises of God. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Hello, welcome to the Good News program. This is Greg Fritz and we've got more good news for you today. We've been teaching a series called Living With No Regrets and I want to encourage you to take a look at our website and if you're interested in this complete teaching, you can get this series, Living With No Regrets. It's a four CD series or it's a download. Uh, you can have this downloaded to your device before we finish this program and you can listen to these messages over and over again. If you're within the continental U.S., we will pay the postage and if not, you can download it and have it on your device. It's just a, a teaching that really touches everybody. I've had a greater response from uh, people on this teaching than anything I've ever done, and I just know it'll be a blessing to you. In fact, today we're going to kind of recap where we've been and give you kind of an overview of this entire teaching, this entire message, Living With No Regrets. We started out there are several areas in life or experiences in life that cause regrets. And we started with number one, which would be missed opportunities. With each of these areas, we have a key scripture. And the area of missed opportunities, we chose Joel 2.25. Missed opportunities would be, you know, I should have, could have, would have, but I didn't. And you can't go back and redo it. And so it's a, a missed opportunity. We've all had those. Joel 2.25 says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. And this is just a promise that God can restore years. He can, he can make up the difference. If you've missed opportunities and it's cost you time and money and you feel like it's set you back in life, I encourage you to let God make it up. Make up the difference. He can do that supernaturally. And we made this statement that God can do more with the time you have left in your life than you could if you went back and tried to live life over again and do it right the second time. Uh, you know, God called you and he saw you and he chose you and he saved you and he factored all of your mistakes into the process. And so God is still ready. He's never given up on you. He's never quit. He can still do what he said he would do in your life. That is encouraging. The second area was past sins. And we spent some time talking about the doctrine of forgiveness and the sin of unforgiveness. We have a scripture here, Daniel 11:35. This is very encouraging for everybody that's ever made a mistake. It says, and some of those of understanding shall fall. There will be some who, who knew better, who were educated or Christians, or they, they were, uh, you know, schooled in the things of God, and yet they still made mistakes. And it says they will, that will happen, Daniel 11, 35. Some of them will fall, but God can take those failures and use them to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. That is a great promise for real people who live life and make mistakes. God can still uh, complete his work in you and do what he said and use your failures to help prepare you for what he has for you. And so that is a powerful promise. Then we talked about broken relationships. And these are relationships that just didn't last. Maybe they were strong and healthy at one time and for one reason or another, you've gone your separate ways with someone. And we've used Romans 12, 18. It says, if it, was, if it is possible, Paul said, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. If it's possible, it's not always possible. And I'm going to go over these steps because we've just completed this teaching, uh, this section, and I'm going to go back over these steps. But this scripture is very powerful in this area. He says, if it's possible, which means it's not always possible. If it is possible, live peaceably with all men. Now, he didn't state this, but he implied it. If it's not possible to live peaceably with all men, move on. There comes a point where it's time for you to just move on in your life and do what, what you're called to do, what you're supposed to do. You can't try to fix something that's broken. We gave you 
four points, and I'm going to give them again in this section of teaching on broken relationships. The first point to realize is this, not every relationship you have will last a lifetime. We've thought maybe that we were supposed to maintain every Christian relationship or friendship that we'd ever made, and that's just unrealistic. That's not going to happen. Paul and Barnabas separated. They went their separate ways. Paul and Peter had their, had their encounters, you know, that weren't so pleasant. And, and that, those things happen in life, and it's not necessarily, doesn't mean you're abnormal or it's a bad thing. You just have to pick up the pieces and move ahead. We shouldn't let any relationship stand between us and God. We shouldn't let any relationship determine our success in the things of God because really our life on this earth is between us and God. We shouldn't let any other person get between us and distract us or divert us, divert our attention or change our course. We are here to do the will of God. We've been chosen, accepted, saved, forgiven, redeemed, blessed by God to do His will. We're here to please Him, not to please people. Number two, the second thing that's important to realize in the area of broken relationships is it hurts to lose friends. Nobody's saying that this is easy. Life is not always easy and it hurts when you lose friends in ministry or church or, or relationships that you've made through the years. And it's a very painful experience, but it's one that you can get through. It's one that you can get over. It's one that the Lord wants you to move forward from and not spend the rest of your life looking back. You can get over the pain. Jesus is the healer of the broken heart and he can heal you of your wounds. And if you'll believe that, you can move forward in your life and not be broken because of what's happened to you. Number three, always attempt to restore. We ought to do our best to keep maintain relationships. We ought not be the bad friend, the bad one in the situation. Try to be the bigger person and always attempt to restore and realize it's not always going to work in every case. But if we do our part and we strive to live peaceably with all men and sometimes it doesn't work out, then that brings us to step number four. Get over it. Just move on. You know, chances are you lived your life before that person came into your life. And now I'm not talking about your spouse. That's on a whole different level. You can't just walk away from your spouse and say, well, things just didn't work out. You need to take extra precaution to salvage your marriage. And so I'm not applying these things to marriage. You need to deal with uh, counseling, pastoral counseling, and get help in that area. But, but if it's a, a relationship, a friend, even sometimes relatives, different people in your life that have come along, chances are they weren't in your life your entire life. You had a life before them and you'll have a life after they, after they depart. Uh, you just need to, to realize that, that your well-being and your success and, and your wholeness as a person is, is true in Christ. And other people come and go, but Jesus should be consistent. Your relationship with your Father God should be consistent whether anybody else likes it or not. And God will make sure that He adds people to your life to, to enrich it and to enhance it and to help you get where you're going. Uh, some of the people that maybe have gone their separate ways in the past aren't really going to help you, wouldn't have helped you get where you're going, and so you just have to get over it and move on. Life is not a popularity contest. Success in life is not determined by how many friends you have or how many friends you keep. And so uh, uh, these are just facts that I think need to be stated, need to be um, meditated on every once in a while. We need to be reminded of them because we can get so hurt over, over relationships more than any other thing in life. You know, life would be perfect if you could live it in a vacuum with no people involved. But boy, you start adding people to the, to the mix and drama ensues. And uh, people do come and go. And that's just part of life. Well, let's move on. I've got more teaching on that, but you can go to get our study notes. That's, those are free on our website. If you go to the study note button, you can download the Living With No Regrets study notes and you can go over these things for yourself. I want to move on into an area that I call bitterness. I actually have it titled Bitterness and the Big Picture. 
Bitterness is something that we're all susceptible to, and you've probably dealt with the temptation to be bitter at some time or another. I looked up the word bitterness, and it simply means anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. And uh, we've all been treated unfairly, and if you haven't, you will be. Uh, this is just part, part of life's experiences. People are not going to, you know, people aren't going to know, not everybody's going to know how awesome you are and what a wonderful, valuable person you are and how great you are. Not everybody's going to appreciate you like your grandmother does or, or like your mother does. Uh, not everybody's going to respond to you like they, you want them to. And some people are just going to treat you unfairly. Life sometimes is unfair. We are just going to be in situations that are uncomfortable, that are painful, and sometimes they're just unfair. What do you do? Well, it's easy to just give in to a spirit of bitterness. Just get mad and resentful and give up and just sit in a stew for the rest of your life. Some people have used bitterness to excuse themselves from striving for greatness. This is not a recipe for happiness. You need to move forward and say, I am not going to give up on life because bad things have happened to me. I don't know what's happened in your life, but I can almost promise you that there are other people that have had worse things happen and they've made the best of it. They've gone on and become what they were supposed to become. They've done great things. They've borne fruit unto God, even though they've experienced unfair treatment, injustice, painful experiences, and, and they, maybe they didn't have the opportunities that some other people had, but they took what they had and they made the most of it. And that's all we can do with life. Let me read this scripture because this is the one we want to work from in this section of teaching. It's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 15. It says, pursue peace with all people. So we're kind of still talking about relationships here because bitterness will come from most of the time from your experience with people. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. So bitterness is a real danger. It's a real enemy to living life. And we need to be aware of it and how it works and how subtly it comes in. He says a root of bitterness. So it, it comes in small and then it grows bigger and defiles not only the person, but also those around it. It can, it can spread from person to person. You don't have to end up angry and bitter and disappointed in life no matter what's happened to you. Think about this. You can't control everything that goes on around you. You can't control many of the circumstances that you find yourself in, but you can control the way you react to them. And you can refuse to allow a root of bitterness to spring up in your soul. That may be the easiest route and that may be the most tempting thing to do, but by knowing how dangerous and how detrimental bitterness is to human existence, you can now stop bitterness. He says to us, don't allow a root of bitterness to spring up. That means you can control this. As I said, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you react, and bitterness is your reaction. It's not what people do to you. Nobody can make you bitter. N bitterness doesn't come on you and overtake you. Bitterness is your reaction to what's happened to you. And, and you know, I don't have to give you examples of people that are bitter. You don't have to be old to be bitter. You can be young and bitter. You can have a, an attitude, a chip on your shoulder, and, and just be, be, be filled with thoughts of how unfair life is and how little you had to, to work with. But that's no way to get ahead in life. That's no way to live your life. We've only, we've only got one life to live, and there's no need to waste it on bitterness and resentment and anger. Let me read it again. The definition of bitterness is anger and disappointment at being treated unfairly. I can't stop you from being treated unfairly. You know, society has tried to make everybody equal and give everybody equal opportunity. That's just not possible in this life. We can do our best and we can certainly grieve at injustice and unfairness, but we can't make the world a fair place. 
people are going to deal with uncertainty and they're going to deal with challenges and they're going to deal with attacks. And we've got to learn that, that just because we deal with them, I mean, one person deals with one kind and level and variety of attack and injustice and other people deal with others, but we've got to take what we have and move forward and say, Lord, I've got one life to live. I'm going to live it for you. I'm not going to get sidetracked by bitterness and resentment and despair. These are all signs and symptoms of regret. We need to attack regret. We need to stand against it and not allow it to take root in our lives. And I'm going to help you see the big picture here so that you can look at life maybe from a different perspective and be thankful. We can replace bitterness and resentment with thankfulness and rejoicing. We have the capacity, the ability to do that, and nobody can stop you from doing that. The people who have done it, scripturally speaking, in, in the past have succeeded uh, beyond their wildest dreams, and so can you. If you're being motivated by bitterness and anger and resentment, that is wrong. You need to eliminate those from your life and begin to be motivated by the love of God. I want to read to you the Amplified Version translation for Hebrews 12, 14, and 15. It says, No root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and many become contaminated and defiled by it. So bitterness is resentment, rancor, hatred at being treated unfairly in most cases. And, and this is something that we need to look at. There are people, if you want to go to the beginning of life, not everybody's born the equal. Not everybody's born with equal opportunities. And that's just, that's just unfortunate. There are people that are born in broken homes. There are people who are born orphans. Their parents abandon them. There are people who are born in poverty. Or there are people who are born in war-stricken areas. And they've experienced nothing but turmoil and war and famine and pestilence. There are people that were born in slavery. Thank God slavery is being done away with on the earth. But there were people for thousands of years who were born and lived and died in slavery. And that's not fair. That is not fair to be the proper of another person. It goes against everything that Christian values hold dear, but it did happen, and it has happened. We can't change some of these things. And you may say, well, why, why do these things happen? How can that be fair? How can God allow such a thing? Well, the, 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 if you go back to the beginning of, of the world, uh, man is the one who sinned and plunged the world into sin and, and darkness, not God. And God was faced with a choice. Either he could wipe out all of creation and just forget the whole thing or allow men and women to be born into a fallen world. And that's what's happened. God said, instead of doing away with humanity, I'm going to allow them to be born in a fallen world, give them an opportunity to find me and to rejoin the, the original plan, which was to be God's children and God's family. And he decided, and I'm glad that he did, he decided it would be better for humans to be born in a fallen world than not to be born at all. If you would look at life as a gift, because it is, life is a gift. It could be as if you had never been. You could have never existed at all. And that would have been far worse than being born into a fallen world and deal for a temporary period of time with injustice and unfairness and ill treatment. We, we could have never existed and we would have never had a chance to know God or to experience his love or to experience the joys of heaven throughout eternity. And if you could see life from that perspective, you'd realize that it would be better for me to be born into poverty, to be born and never learn to read or write, to be born into a life that is limited in every way. I would rather be born and have that opportunity so that I can find God and know God and be saved and spend eternity with him. You know, it says this in James, what is your life? James 4:14. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. We are so focused on the here and now, rightfully so. I mean, 10 years, 20 years, 30, it seems like a long time. High school seems like a long time. That's just four years for most of us. Uh, but when you look at life one day at a time, it seems like it's taking forever, but it isn't. 
And what James is saying is it's just a vapor. It appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. You cannot judge your existence by just life on this earth. Did you know in a thousand years, it won't matter if you are a prince or a pauper. It won't matter if you are the most educated, successful person on earth, or if you never did anything right with your life. If you accept Jesus, this life is, is just like a brief moment. It's a moment in time that will soon pass away and will spend eternity with God. And things will become right. Things will be fair. Injustices will be removed. Rewards will be given. People will be recognized for what they did right for God and for the opportunities they took and made good on in this life. Oh, if we could just see it from heaven's perspective. You know, you can't judge your life by one bad day. And when, when people, you know, they get bitter and resentful and they look at their lives and they get depressed, they're, they're trying to judge their entire existence, which starts the day they were born and lasts forever and ever and ever. And, and if you weren't born in a fallen world, that wouldn't be the case. You wouldn't have the opportunity to live forever with God. It, 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 it would be like somebody who, who was living life today and had a bad day. Have you ever had a bad day? I mean, things just went wrong. They started out wrong and they went wrong all day. Maybe you made mistakes. It cost you time and money. It cost you friendships or whatever. You just had a really bad day. You can't judge your whole life by one bad day. You can't look at one bad day and say, I'm a failure. I'm miserable. I'm unhappy. And, and this is true for my entire life. No, it was one day out of your life. If you're playing a game, a football game or, or a, a basketball game, you can't judge the entire game by one bad play. Let's say that the football teams are on the field and, and they hike the ball and they lose 20 yards. The quarterback gets sacked and the line falls backward and, and it, the play falls apart and nobody runs their routes and the running backs don't block and everything goes bad. They lose 20 yards and have to punt the ball. That's a bad play. But it doesn't mean it's a bad game. It doesn't mean the whole game is a waste. It doesn't mean life is over. It doesn't mean you should end it all. It doesn't mean you're not a good team. It doesn't mean you can't come back and do something positive. When we look at our lives and say, life's not worth living, that is a lie. Because of what I've been born into, it's not fair. I'm angry. I, I hate everybody. I hate everything. Listen, you have a chance to make something out of your life. Now, I don't know where you are. You may be serving life in prison in solitary confinement, but did you know you can take that life and you can give it to God? You may be the most limited person in the world. You may be living in a hospital room and not ever walk out of it again, but you can take the life you have and you can live it for God. You can take the time you have. You see, your, your life is represented by your, by, by your time and your decisions and your will, not just your performance. There will be people who will make lots and lots of money and be very successful in the eyes of the world, but they won't have done anything for God. And there will be other people who don't ever make the news. They never do anything worth reporting, but they gave what they had to God, and God will honor them and reward them greatly in heaven. You see, we all just have one life to live whether it's a great life, a big life, a notable life, well-known life, or an obscure life that nobody recognizes. We all have one. And God is looking at what percentage of that life will you live for me? What are you going to do with what you have? Remember the widow that had the two mites? And she went in and gave two pennies in the offering. And Jesus said that woman gave more than everybody else combined. So, well, some of them gave lots of money. Yeah, but they gave out of their abundance. Overall, they might have given 5% or 1%. This woman gave 100%. God recognizes percentages. It's not about who knows you and how famous you become in life. It's about what percentage of your existence did you truly give to God. And nobody can stop you from doing that. Even if you live in an eight-foot cell, you can take your existence and say, Lord, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to give my days, my nights, my existence, my life, my body to you. And you can use it however you want to. And if you do that, you, be, you may be like the guy who got five talents and you took all of them and reinvested them. 
God's pleased with that. God's proud of that. I remember something Billy Graham said, and we're going to close with this, but uh, somebody came to Billy Graham, the great evangelist, and said, oh, Billy Graham, you're going to receive such rewards in heaven. You're going to be so blessed and rewarded because of all the souls that you've saved and seen saved in your ministry. And he says, no, I'm not. I'm not going to get any more reward than the little lady that vacuums the church. And they said, what? How could you say that? He said, look, I'm just doing what God's told me to do. And I'm going to be rewarded based on my obedience to God in my ministry. But if God's told somebody to vacuum the church and they're faithful to do that, they're going to receive the rewards of obedience just as much as I do. It's based on what you have to give, not what you do. You can take wherever you are, whatever you have, and say, Lord, I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not going to be resentful. I'm going to take what I have and give it to you. And I expect in eternity for you to work all these other details out. You can right the wrongs. You can, you can turn justice around. And you can do what's necessary so that we can all be equal and happy. But in this life, I refuse to let bitterness defile my thinking. Wow, I hope you got something out of that. This is real teaching for real people and it'll work for you. No need to live your life with regret. You can move on and be happy. Praise God. Well, we've run out of time today. We're going to continue this teaching in our next session. Until then, may God's best be yours. No matter what you've been through, God has made it possible for you to be free from your past and excited about your future. In this series, you'll learn how to apply God's word to your past so you can experience joy, unspeakable and full of glory. To order your copy of this series, visit our website, gregfritz.org. I would just like to remind you of our scripture cards. They've been put together for your benefit and they're free. If you live in the continental U.S., we'll mail them to you. And these scripture cards include the scriptures that we're using in this teaching on all the four areas of missed opportunities, broken relationships, past sins, the loss of loved ones. All those scriptures are included here with confessions. And as you take these like medicine, they will change your life. They will root out bitterness, regret, resentment, and sorrow and fill you with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Get your scripture cards today. In this series, you'll learn how to apply God's word to your past so you can experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. To order your copy of this series, visit our website, gregfritz.org. Coming up next on Good News with Greg Fritz. It doesn't matter necessarily what you do in life, but what matters is how you do it. Who are you doing it for? Who has your allegiance? Who do you relate to? Who do you look to to please? You have the gift of life. Praise God, that's something to be thankful for. You may never leave your village wherever you were born. You may never leave your state, your nation. You may never go outside of your town but you can live a successful life for God and you don't have to be bitter. You don't have to envy the people who can travel and get away and get around. You don't have to envy the people that have more than you. You can take what you have, give it to God and say, one of these days we're gonna be in heaven and everything's gonna be made right and I'm gonna be happy forever and ever and ever and it'll make this life look like the snap of a finger.